The Bible has a lot to say about widows. The gospel, which uh, Nancy read a little earlier, actually has two references, two completely separate kind of references, just in that one little passage about widows. In the first bit, Jesus is calling out what he calls, what my, this, this, this version calls the teachers of the law. Sometimes they're called the scribes. Sometimes they're called the lawyers. And we'll, I'll talk to you a bit about that a little later on. But at the, he says, they devour widows' houses. They devour widows' houses. And that's not a good thing. <laughs> and uh, uh, then in the second part, it's, it's, he kind of is, is uh, overlooking the temple uh, compound. This huge, massive, it's multiple football f- ball fields in size. The temple is in the very middle, and there's this huge compound. But, it, but at the temple, there was a box. Uh, they call it the treasury, I guess. And people would put in their alms and their givings for, ostensibly, I guess, for the, for the priests to distribute to those in need, to the poor, etc. And in this story, this, the very wealthy people, or the well-to-do people, are, uh, are putting in, you know, goodly bits. But aren't, they aren't that particularly noticeable in comparison to what they have. <laughs> and the widow is putting in everything she's got. And uh, so Jesus is pointing her out and commending her. So that's, that's just in the gospel. So we didn't, as I've told you, we, we often read a couple of scriptures at the other churches. And today we read from 1 Kings 17. And you say, oh, yes. <laughs> it's a bit Elijah. Or as, so we now have a, a grandson who's by that name, and apparently it's Elijah. I don't know, Elijah, Elijah. And uh, so it's, it's the story of Elijah. So Elijah as you may remember, was uh, kind of battling in Israel, the northern kingdom back in the Old Testament times. Uh, they had a guy named King Ahab, and he was a bad dude. <laughs> and he and his, his wife, whose name was Jezebel. Paul, you shouldn't be telling these things. You, you studied all Jezebel. Have you ever heard the word Jezebel? Jezebel was the queen, and she was the wicked queen. And, and they, you know, they, the, the people were under their, uh, under their watch, were worshiping many gods, etc., etc., so Elijah was a prophet in those days, and he was always being hounded by, hounded and, and hiding from King Ahab. Uh, so at some point, God, through Elijah, uh, Elijah prays, and there's a drought, no rain on the land for three and a half years. So it's pretty rough, pretty rough going, pretty rough times. And uh, Elijah's hungry too, like, along with everybody else. So God sends him off to uh, a widow in Sidon. Now Sidon is Gentile country. Interestingly enough. So off he goes to, to be with the widow. And so in the, in the story, he comes to her and he, he sees her. She's out gathering sticks outside her home. And he says, could you uh, get me a drink of water? She heads off to get the drink of water. He says, oh, and, uh, and could, you get me, uh, could you get me some bread too to go with that water? And she's like, you can hear the sigh. <laughs> she says, well, I'm out gathering sticks to, to, uh, to, uh, to make a fire for myself and my son. We're going to have the last little bit of meal that I've got, we're going to cook it up, and that's going to be it, and then we're going to die. And Elijah says, oh, no, don't worry about it. You go do what I tell you, and make me my food, <laughs> and, uh, then, um, and then you can feed y- your son and yourself, and it's going to be great. He said, the Lord, I say by the word of the Lord that the, your, your uh, jar of meal will not fail you, or your jar of oil will not fail you until rain comes back on the land. So she, 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 she does it. She does what Elijah says. And sure enough, uh, they're fed all the, way through the, uh, uh, all the way through the drought, all the way through the famine. So that's, that's just the first part of the story. So the, the, the following part of the story, same widow, a Gentile lady, um, her, her son dies. And she, she cries out to Elijah, and Elijah cries out to God. And, and God, through Elijah, raises the child back to life again. So it's a resurrection story in the Old Testament. Now, that gets echoed, actually, in the New Testament when Jesus goes in in his rounds through Galilee. He goes to a little town called Nain. And as he's going to the town, um, uh, they're carrying this coffin out of the the town with a young man in it. He's the only son of a widow of that city or that town, Nain. So you probably know this story well. So the famous story of the the widow of Nain. So, so, uh, you know, people are mourning and crying because... You know, back in the day, he was, he was to be her support. I mean, she had no recourse except this, this son, and he'd now died, so she had nothing. So it says, Jesus took compassion on, on them. He goes, he touches the, the, the boy or the, or the casket or whatever it was. The boy sits up, <laughs> alive again, and everybody's like astonished. 
So, so Jesus raises the son of the widow of Nain. Another widow story. Um, and the Old Testament is chock full. You go through the prophets, you know, those, the great prophets, Hosea and Amos and Isaiah and Jeremiah. They're always, not always, but often they, they refer to the need for the people to take care of the widows and the orphans and uh, the strangers and the exiles uh, and to have a heart for the, the you know, the foreigners. And um, so that, that's something, because, because they got away from that. The people had, had, you know, they got kind of self-centered and absorbed with their own uh, wealth and uh, their own self-happiness, and they were forgetting about the people who were in need around them. Uh, I've been preaching a little bit on James the last while before I went on holidays and forgot everything. <laughs> James, kind of echoing once again the Old Testament, has this little quip in James, James 1.27. Religion that God our Father accepts, this is New Testament, by the way. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. He, just, he, he, he centers that out, interestingly enough, led by the Spirit of God, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Uh, First Timothy, so Timothy, the letters to Timothy are, are called the pastoral epistles, or the letters. So Timothy was a mentee of Paul, uh, Timothy and Titus. And so Paul wrote to them to explain how they ought to handle things in the church context. In chapter 5 of First Timothy, about half that chapter is dedicated to what, how, do, how they should uh, take care of and handle the situation with the widows. <laughs> um, and so there's a, like more than half the chapter is about that. And uh, basically, he tells them, like, if you've, if you've got widows who have family, that family should be taking care of the widows. And if they don't have any family, then the rest of you guys are in charge. It's on you. <laughs> the, you, as a community of believers, are charged with the care of the widows. And uh, verse 5, it says, The widow who is really in need and left all alone puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and to ask God for help. Very profound little verse here. We may come back to that. So... The widow who is really in need and left all alone puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and to ask God for help. So there's a little bit of sampling of stuff in the Bible about widows, and there's a lot more than that. It's, it's common. Well, some of you here today, it's your life. It's your experience. Uh, oh, Jan, Jan here, she's already waved her hand. She knows that that's her. And there's the widow's bench back there. There's a couple of you back there. And, you know, Gladys here. Uh, I don't know who else. Uh, but, you know, say who? Diane, Diane, of course. Yeah, so, so you know, it, often in churches, there are uh, quite a number of widows, we find. And I've had widows in each of the churches as I, I went along today. So you, this is your life. This is your experience. You know this better than the rest of us. We're only observers. But most of us, if not all of us, know quite a few widows. Um, my, of course, for me, my mom is the one closest to me that I know the best. And I've kind of followed her situation. She's been a widow for 28 years. Uh, Dad died back in 1990, so 28. And so a couple of observations <laughs> that kind of very obvious things, I think, but I'm going to put them out there anyway, uh, about widowhood. Uh, first, there is an increased vulnerability attached to widowhood. Okay? It, it increases your vulnerability in life. So besides the huge emotional difficulty or the, of, of this grief of losing someone you love and you've lived with for maybe most of your life, perhaps, uh, and the loss of that companionship. I mean, those, those in themselves are huge, make you hugely vulnerable emotionally. But there's often things like financial loss, concerns about home maintenance, anxiety about safety, and a host of other things. So that's just the reality of, of being a widow. On the other hand, this is the other thing I've noticed. Often, there seems to be an increased inner strength, uh, a kind of a, a renewed emotional fortitude, if you will, as well as, at least for the Christian, a deeper spiritual life. Now, Jan, since you're so outspoken, I'm going to use you as an example. <laughs> Jan, Jan just went through a, a tough period in the hospital. And um, about, what, five years ago, five or six years ago, you were in the hospital before, and you really had a tough time. And uh, uh, she really struggled with that. So then, since then, Doug, Doug was alive, Doug was alive then. Uh, so since then, Doug has died. Jan has become a widow. So this time when she was in the hospital, she, it wasn't fun. <laughs> and, uh, but 
you know, we, we talked this week and, and Jan told me that she just, she had this great kind of peace and she felt God's presence and she, she kind of knew inner strength as she went through that trial. And I just thought that was very uh, indicative of perhaps partly at least what has happened in, you know, in the loss of Doug and how, how much more she's experienced the strengthening of God in her life. Now you could, yeah, she, and she, she, would, she would agree with that. Uh, after my dad died, uh, so for instance, my, my mom had to take over all the stuff that my dad used to do. He, she took over the paying of the bills and she took over the care for the house and she even learned how to drive. Now, we, all, we always put drive in quotation marks with my mom. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, she's still driving. Hopefully not for the winter, but uh, don't, don't tell. So, but it, to, to be fair, she didn't learn to drive till she was up in her upper 60s, like late 60s, maybe almost 70 years old. So she didn't have the, you know, it's a lot easier to learn things when you're young. So she had to kind of... To, to work it through a lot. She went back for the test until sh she wore them down. <laughs> so, so my mom, but she learned, she's learned to cope, right? So the, co the gospel passage today actually has reference to both these things, both the vulnerability and the deeper life. So first the vulnerability, with, we see this with uh, Jesus' words about the scribes. <laughs> Watch out for the teachers of the, so the, the scribes, sometimes, the, the, sometimes the, some of the versions call them the lawyers. But when we hear the word lawyer, we think of guys like, you know, Fraser Rogers and Ray Selby and, and you know, others around here that, that practice law. That's not what they're talking about. They're talking about people who were experts in the law of Moses. So it's actually kind of a religious thing. And they were the teachers of the scriptures. Sound like anybody we know? So watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues. We call them churches now. And the places of, no, I mean, there's still synagogues, of course, but just to do the, the parallel situation. And the places of honor at banquets. Now, when I read this, I can't help remind myself of what it's maybe pastor types, <laughs> preacher types, reverent types, because, you know, we've all... And, and uh, I'm one of them, and I feel that kind of pull and draw. I'm not sure if I've succumbed, to how much I've succumbed over the years, but <laughs> it's there. And you, you know, see people that fall into this. You know, they want to have the honor and the privilege uh, of that position. Then he says, they devour widows' houses, and for a show, make lengthy prayers. Ouch. Such men will be punished most severely, says Jesus. But this, they devour widows' houses. He doesn't really explain that, but what, what is implied is they somehow abuse uh, a, a position of privilege to take advantage of the vulnerability of a widow, uh, possibly to get money from them. I can't help but be reminded of some of our shyster televangelists who, who you know, pound the pulpit over the, over the television uh, to get people to give, and many times they prey on people, uh, on widows. People who are all alone and they're, they're susceptible to things <laughs> and like that. And they give all kinds of money to these, these people and then they, they don't hardly have enough to live on. See, that would be preying on widows or, as he says, devouring widows' houses. So that's still, still a thing that happens. So that's, that's, this passage, to me, speaks about the vulnerability of widows. But the second chunk speaks about this inner strength. So here's this, this widow. There's all these people with all kinds, you know, lots of money or relatively lots of money and they're putting money in the treasury for the poor but they don't even feel it it's such a little part of what they have that you know they don't even notice it and it says she i tell you <laughs> so it says but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins two cents she put in her two cents uh, they put in her two cents i'm not sure if that's where the expression came from probably not and uh, it's also, in, I think the King James calls it her might, and that's where we get the idea of the widow's might. Remember? M-I-T-E. So it's just, it says, worth only a fraction of a penny. So it's like almost nothing. And Jesus says, calls his disciples, says, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out, out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. And we're like flabbergasted. <laughs> Why would anybody do that? 
But, and Jesus isn't saying, well, all you widows, you should be putting in every cent you've got into the, church, into the church coffers. That's not the point. He's pointing out that this is someone who didn't care. She's not attached to the things that, that the rest of the world is attached to. She put her hope entirely in God, and when she gave away what she had, she knew that he would take care of her. So what Jesus is, is, is presenting to his disciples is, is someone, this widow, who is a person of immense faith, of great deep faith. So, now, I think there's more here in, the, in, in that the scriptures, I, I just touched on some of the references to widows through the scriptures. So, like, there's a whole book about a widow in the Old Testament. Anybody remember what that one's called? By her name, Ruth. Ruth's a fam this famous widow, and her mother-in-law, Naomi, is the other, one of the other major characters. She's a widow. And Naomi's really concerned about her, her daughter-in-law's well-being and sets up this whole kind of intricate thing for her to, to connect up with this guy named Boaz. And, you know, so she eventually gets remarried and to take care of. And, she, and, and Boaz and Ruth uh, are become, I think, it's the great-grandparents of King David. So it's a little bit of the history of David, but it's also this great story about the struggles of widowhood. So there's all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, but I think there's more here because the Bible seems to focus a lot on, on widows. And talk about, and it's not just simply that we should have a mind for them and have a heart for them and be, you know, understand that the, the, the care of widows is upon the community of faith as a whole, although that's definitely true and it's definitely taught. I think there's something more. I think that widows have something to teach us about the spiritual life. Now, so for starters, and this is maybe not something that you think of very much, but the spiritual life has to do with dying and loss. The spiritual life has to do with dying and loss. I mean, Jesus says often, these are the things that people gloss over when they read the Gospels. <laughs> Jesus says them quite a bit. He says things like, whoever would find their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake and the Gospel will find it. Hmm. Losing your life. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, no, you just have to lose your life. And that he's, no, is he just, you know throwing out a riddle to kind of tease us and make us impress us somehow? No. He's telling us about real, the reality of the spiritual world, the spiritual life, the life with Christ. He, in, it, he says lots of times, we read the Gospels, he says, whoever will come after me must take up their cross daily and follow me. In the Gospel of John, he says, unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it will bear no fruit. And he's talking about, this is, this is the dynamic of the spiritual life. It's about death and resurrection. It's about dying and coming back to life again. And uh, so th that's a real thing. Paul, in his, in his epistles, kind of explains the theology of it a little bit more, I suppose. So he tells us things like, Jesus died for us all. If Jesus died for us all, then we're all dead. <laughs> right? Makes, it, it makes... It makes spiritual sense. Not, it doesn't make rational sense particularly. You know, if, if one died for all, then all have died, he says. So, so, and he, he kind of elaborates on that quite a bit to, to point out to us that once you put your faith in Jesus, uh, you enter into him. God places you in him. And you were in him when he died. And then you were, he says, uh, uh, that... Uh, as, uh, and then we were buried with him in baptism, so that, and that like as Christ was raised from the dead, you too might walk in newness of life. So there's this whole dynamic of death and resurrection that is at work in the Christian, because we are in Christ, who went through death and went through resurrection. So, so that's kind of theological, but it's true, and it's real, and it's powerful. People don't, I, I think we... we very often in the church, we kind of have the superficial idea that Jesus died for our sins. Not that it's really superficial. It's, the, it's, the, the, it's foundational, but it's, it's, you know, it's great to have your sins forgiven. It's wonderful. <laughs> but Jesus and his death were about more than that. They're, more about del they're about deliverance from the power and the hold and the grip of, of sin on, on human lives. And that's a grip that you cannot kick off by yourself. You and I do not have the power. The only way out of it is to die. So that may sound mystical, <laughs> and it sort of is, but it also so so. It, but it's it's true, uh, and and then it has and then there's an experiential part to it. So uh, Paul, in another place, he says, so um, uh, 
uh, we have died with Christ, the, 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 the death of Christ is at work in us so that the life of Christ also might be at work, uh, might be shown through us. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave you to puzzle on that, <laughs> but that's huge. You know, if you, like I, on a weekly, daily basis, struggle with, with sin, well, much of which is unconscious to us, and it just comes along and we, we become aware of it through our feelings, and, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm in greatly in need of the grace of God through the cross of Christ for deliverance from that thing. And, and, and it's ours in him. It's, it's victory in him. But there's a suffering involved. There's a loss involved. There's a death involved. So if we would know and follow Jesus, there needs to be a dying to things like self-centeredness. Right? So we are by nature pretty self darn self-centered. Christ is not. We, there's a dying to our attachment to material things. And we, we all get kind of glued into things, things, you know, materialism. Not that there's anything wrong with those things. It's the attachment to them, like money, possessions, houses, cars. <laughs> and, you know, ultimately to be attached to them and to have our security bound up in them, that's idolatry. So we need to die to that. We need to die to our individualism. Die to individual. In, in our day and age, boy, we are so individualistic. We want to take care of everything ourselves. We don't want people to know about our private concerns. <laughs> right? And yet, if we're followers of Christ, we're called into uh, community life, into interdependence. And that's a real thing. And in order to, to, to be part of an interdependent community, there has to be a death to uh, individualism. And especially there needs to be a death to our pride. My gosh. Uh, we're a proud bunch. At least I am. <laughs> this has been my great struggle over all my life. Just, you know, uh, humility does not come natural to me one bit. Because it may, maybe it does to some. But it, it's only by the grace of God at work in me at all that uh, I have found deliverance from, you know, the addiction of pride, if you will. Uh, and, and, and it's painful. It's a painful experience. So this brings us to a greater vulnerability. If that kind of stuff's happening in your life, that kind of loss, uh, you're more vulnerable. Our security is no longer tied up in money or self or position or anything like that. The things that the world holds is, is important. But only in God, only in Christ. We trust him completely with everything. You know, and that can feel a little scary. But at the same time, we are strengthened within ourselves by grace, by love, by the Holy Spirit. We have a peace and a confidence that the world cannot give. Jesus says, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. My peace I give to you. So widows and other followers of Jesus, may we all know Christ's comfort and his presence in our losses and his amazing inner strength for our every trial. Shall we pray?